Hello, everybody. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Uh, our um, panel is going to start soon. So I just would like to make sure that we are live on YouTube and Facebook in different places. So I just would like to make sure. Perfect. Looks like YouTube has started. So I would like to ask uh, whoever is joining us. I see that quite a few people are joining us. Uh, from the M3 Center uh, YouTube account, please. Oh, perfect. Thank you, Sedan. Uh, and then I have uh, heard that people are hearing. So we have a very, very interesting panel today. And I, this is the, definitely the first one that I am uh, doing here. My name is Professor Jihan Chobanolu. I am the McKibben and Dart Chair Professor at the College of Hospitality and Tourism Leadership uh, in the uh, at the University of South Florida, and I have two distinguished guests with me, um, and I would like to invite them one at a time. Uh, Professor Hanching uh, Chiu, welcome uh, to our panel, Dr. Hanchin. Uh, she is from Nankai University. She is the dean of the College of Tourism and Service Management. Welcome, Hanchin. Thank you, Chihan. Good evening. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, thank you. And I also have Professor Valentina de la Corte. Uh, both of them are very dear friend of mine, and she's the academic coordinator for the hospitality program at the University of Naples, Federico II. Welcome, Valentina. Thank you, Sian. Welcome. Hi. Hi to everybody. Glad to be Wonderful. here. So we are live right now. I am in Florida, and Han Chin is in Tianjin, China, and Valentina is in Naples, Italy. It's unbelievable. So it's 8 a.m. in Florida and 8 p.m. in China and 2 p.m. in Italy, right, Valentina? Right. Wonderful. So I would like to just tell the people who are watching us, I see that many people are joining us, which is wonderful. So for those of you who are joining us, uh, please feel free to write your questions in the comment box wherever you are watching this. Uh, I see that from Facebook, um, that Dr. Pat Morio joined us, wonderful. Uh, he is saying hi to, to, to you. And okay, so we are going to take questions a little bit later, but I would like to um, start with what is going on right now in China and Italy. Since the coronavirus kind of started first in China and now is looks like appears to be ending, uh, in China. We'll start with Han Jin. Han Jin, can you please tell us uh, what is life look like in China now? Uh, well, so uh, life in China slowly coming to normal, we hope, but I'm sure it is still different. And uh, But we are starting uh, welcoming our students back on campus and then study on May 8th. Just a few days from today, we are slowly batch by batch. We first of all welcoming the graduating class back to campus. And then also our shopping malls are open with a lot of discount. And our restaurants are open. And uh, our people uh, start going out on the street. I guess probably be a good idea for me to share with you a few videos. Uh, gives you the real picture of what's going on in China, particularly in Tianjin. Thank you, Chihan. Back to you. Sure. I will show the uh, videos that you have prepared for us, uh, Han Jin. Here you are. So maybe after we show the video, you can tell us what's going on in the video. Okay. And the first video, here it is. This looks like a resort, right, Han Chin? And we see some right. few people. So I guess it started to open the hotels and resorts. Is that right? Right, right, right. Yes, yes. And there are a few more videos you probably want to show them. Yes, yes. Let's do it. <laughs> Looks like a shopping place yeah. for a public. And you've got two more videos uh, mm -hmm. from you. And the last one is again from a restaurant. 
，这地界不算大，那说话那调儿还真是有变化。啊，西边杨柳青，啊东边凉长，啊津南跟北陈是一地儿一个样。So these are the videos. What are you going to tell us about these videos, Hanchin? What's going on there? I guess these are some of the videos taken at the resort and also in uh, uh, a city called Xi'an, which is one of the major tourist cities. And uh, also some local restaurants and uh, uh, people going out. I guess what I'm trying to say is that uh, uh, the restaurants are open. Some of restaurants are getting a lot of people. Actually, I was out yesterday for lunch, and probably I would say 50% of the seats are occupied during the uh, peak hour, but uh, pro much, much less busy than before, of course. And then uh, uh, our shopping malls are open, but uh, they, they still have to uh, temperature you. And each of us will be temperatured. And then also, we have to show this green coat meaning that uh, you you are registered and then you are healthy. So they, they do take a lot of uh, measures to make sure that uh, uh, all public places are still safe for people to go. It's more sort of organized behavior, but since uh, uh, so start going back to normal, I think slowly, by, you know, bit by bit. Yeah. I see. So, you know, a lot of people lost hope, at least in the United States, you know, when everything shut down, all restaurants, barbers, shopping centers. Um, and it looks like that if the uh, pandemic is controlled, that things are coming back, even though slowly, but it does come back. It gives a lot of I've seen in your videos a lot of signs of hope. That was very, very good for me, at least personally. I hope so. Yeah, I guess uh, uh, the the virus started in China earlier, uh, in February, uh, late January and February. I think it has been almost three months. So right. I guess uh, I, under control, and the government took a lot of uh, measures, keep social distance, and also uh, control the uh, the traffic very well. I guess uh, it Wonderful. is the working, and it is slowly picking up. Yeah. Just keep Wonderful. Going. Fingers crossed. We still have to take extra measures to make sure everyone is safe and everyone uh, uh, is in good shape. Thank you. Health, health first. Yes. Also, I'm going to ask Valentina, Professor Valentina, in a second. But I see that more than 60 people joined us live, which is wonderful. Uh, we have Professor Han Chin Chu, uh, Chu from Nankai University, China, live. Uh, also, uh, Professor Valentina Della Corte from Naples, Italy, live. So if you have any questions, please write them in the comment box uh, in YouTube or Facebook, wherever you are watching this live stream. Uh, Professor Valentina, what is what about Italy? I know Italy is, you know, of course, dear to many people's heart. We love Italy, just like we love China. And um, it hit Italy very, very hard, right? Kind of like people didn't take it seriously, I guess, in the beginning. At least that's what we hear, right, from the media. And what is going on in Italy right now? Can you please tell us? Yes. Uh, well, in Italy, uh, we just we are just coming out of the lockdown. So uh, today it was the first day that some of the activities are restarting. Uh, we we lived a very serious lockdown because we were not allowed to go out. Uh, and this was very, very hard. But uh, one, one thing I really appreciated was that citizenship uh, answered uh, m really wonderfully. Uh, because uh, I think this, this, this behavior uh, gave the results. In southern Italy, it, it seems to be uh, disappeared. Of course, we have to monitor everything. Uh, but in the, if we look at the daily dates, Data uh, we can see that the, there is a there is a huge increase in the uh, you know <laughs> well-being of the place and of the people. And one one other aspect that uh, people here are really appreciating is the fact that there is no pollution at all, uh, both in the air, in the sea. Uh, nature came out uh, uh, in a wonderful way, and uh, this can be a lesson. But we'll talk about this later, maybe. Yes, <laughs> so, yes. I don't know if you can show the, the video I, I sent you because I would like to, to show you first two pictures of um, uh, two cities in Italy when there was the total lockdown. Uh, 
uh, you know, Venice and the beautiful areas that were totally empty. And it was really unusual. I mean, uh, we have never seen such views, really. Right. Uh, especially yeah, on the screen right now. Okay. Uh, today, live starting. Now, the video, this video was taken by my son, he's 12, it's Giorgio Mario Borrelli. So it's a homemade video. But it can give you an idea of what happened today in Italy that was the first day with a, with a certain opening. Okay. It's not the uh, total opening uh, as in China. I mean, uh, but just some activities were, were open today. And for us, it was wonderful just to see those shops open. Wonderful. So I'm going to show the video. Thanks yeah. to your son uh, who has shot this video for us because today is a big day in Italy, just like you said. Now the lockdown is a little bit. So yeah. life is going to go back to. Let's watch this video. You see the bars that are starting opening? Yeah. Or grocery shops. And we see people, bus? Yeah, Auto. people, you know, 20% uh, of, of the seats can be uh, used in the bus. 20%. Everything is working. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. <laughs> And many people have masks when they go outside. Yes, everybody. Uh, here in Naples, we also have a, a, a very strict uh, government, you know, in the region. Uh, but it was very good. And so uh, we are obliged, of course, to wear the, the masks uh, all over Italy. And uh, so I, right. I, I noticed that people are following all the instructions. Right. So my next question to all of you, and of course, in America, it's no different than what you have seen. But in America, um, the tourism industry is impacted very, very hardly, just like in China, rest of the world. And we see some signs of easing. You know, I'm in Florida. As of tomorrow, uh, May 6th, I believe, uh, May, May, May 5th, uh, they are going to have some ease on restrictions in Florida. So some of the restaurants will open. Georgia, another state in USA, has already opened up uh, earlier uh, with some of the, uh, again, restaurants, barbers, nail salons, uh, things like this. A lot of people say it's too early in America. It's not ready yet, but this is what they are saying. But I would like to also people uh, listen to us from uh, different parts of the world. I see people from Turkey, Italy, and Indonesia. So again, thanks to all of you, by the way, our live uh, audience number increased to almost 80 now, which is so nice. For those of you who are watching us live, please ask your questions for Professor Han Chin from Nanka University in China or uh, Professor Valentina Della Corte from Naples, Italy. My next question to both of you, maybe Han Chin, we will start um, with you, is that what is the impact of corona in tourism in China? We know it's huge. I mean, uh, you know, you can maybe give us some statistics, but what is the whole idea about the impact of tourism in China? And also um, after, after the words, you see, you show us some videos that people come back to restaurants and they have, we have seen people in resorts, but do you think that this is going to increase more? And obviously, I assume that all of these people that we have seen are domestic, right? So people don't travel too much yet, I guess, in, in China. What is the situation right now in terms of domestic tourism uh, within the China? Uh, I guess uh, uh, ever since uh, the shutdown and the domestic tourism was, uh, well, everywhere was stopped, just like uh, in Italy it was shown earlier. But it's only uh, recently uh, the domestic tourism started picking up. But I, uh, would this, I would think that the, the numbers will keep going up if the situation is under control. But uh, I think the Chinese government is prepared to take any necessary measures if you know things can, can get worse sometime. We don't know yet. 
So that's in terms of domestically. We monitor it very closely at all different levels. And uh, international tourists to China is basically stopped. And all international tourists coming to China are mainly uh, through Beijing, Shanghai, and Shenzhen, the, the few major cities plus the borders are uh, under strictly control. And uh, uh, they will be all going through quarantine 14 days and then uh, uh, make sure that they are safe and then they will be allowed to enter into the city. I see. Well, Antina, how about in Italy? What is uh, the situation? Of course, the whole country locked down, right? So there is not a single tourist for this long time, which is very unusual for Italy because Italy was packed with tourists, not only domestic, but from all around the world. What is the situation right now? Yeah, I would like to share with you, with you just a few slides to give an idea of what uh, happened uh, for the pandemic, you know, and uh, therefore, uh, just a minute. And questions also come after you finish, Valentina, we'll uh, bring some questions from the audience. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, so can you see? Yep, we see your okay. slides, yep. Uh, so, um, as regards Italy, uh, we can tell that in Italy, uh, the tourist sector... Uh, can, you, can, you, can you open your slide? Uh, yeah, because sure. it's a s small version right now. Yeah. If you just click on the presentation mode. Okay. Uh, I, just a minute, because maybe it's better this one. Jojo. Right now we see the PowerPoint. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Yes. Okay. Is it better at this? Yes, much better. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, I, uh, in Italy, the the tourism industry uh, is between twelve and fifteen percent of the gross um, domestic product. And if we consider also the connected in you know industries, uh, we get to the twenty five percent of the whole economy in our country. Uh, that counts two hundred and sixteen thousand hospitality firms and twelve thousand travel agencies. So there was a uh, in a, during the the month of March, some statistics uh, measured the the great um, uh, loss of a lot of uh, businesses in the sector uh, that are those that you see here, uh, even if uh, we can tell that, uh, 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 no, we, if we consider these losses, uh, we have to monitor the situation because there is a great enthusiasm in restarting the activities. Uh, as regards the, the incoming tourism, uh, as Xi'an underlined, uh, it's uh, um, absolutely true because our tourism is uh, mainly uh, foreign tourism, you know, so um, compared with the domestic one. And uh, the forecasts say that maybe uh, we will have first uh, tourists from overseas rather than from Europe. Of course, this depends also on the ongoing situation of the pandemic uh, in the different countries. Uh, but some of the experts uh, confirm that the domestic market will be the, the first one to, to look at. And uh, we made a, a survey in Italy um, during the pandemic that showed us that 83% of the Italians plan to go to Italy in Italy. And just a few ones think that they don't have the possibility from an economic point of view. And 44% uh, will be happy to have some kind of uh, uh, faci you know, uh, facilitating uh, uh, interventions from the government. Uh, what I can tell is that we are really um, um, planning a lot of important things because uh, government is taking measures both uh, to, to help the firms uh, with the workers and also the, the problem of the seasonal workers that in Italy are, are a lot really uh, and also supports to the firms in tourist business, entertainment, culture. Uh, these are just the first uh, interventions of the government and we are waiting for some other further uh, in, the, in the next days. Uh, 
what I really would like to, to point out is that firms are showing an incredible uh, will to restart. We had a wonderful webinar last week uh, with the main operators, tour operators, hotel industries, hotel chain, uh, hotel chains and uh, cruising companies. They are all studying the ways to, to, to offer a very safe and, uh, you know, at the same time, warming product uh, with, with a lot of uh, uh, promotional activities. For example, the take a stay bond that I think uh, uh, is used internationally, it's a kind of future where you buy um, the, the, the travel that you can do in a certain time, uh, period of time. And you can also use it as a gift to your friends. Uh, firms are using also the vouchers uh, that are uh, usually, usually um, uh, made by firms because when there are some cancellations, they give you the voucher that can be used in a certain period of time. And there are even destinations like uh, this in southern Italy uh, that is uh, trying to attract uh, tourists by offering uh, some particular reductions on tax paying, uh, incentives of different kind and uh, possible of using the take a stay bond as the way to buy uh, the holiday in that area. So this is uh, the situation right now in Italy. I think uh, we are in front of Wonderful. a very uh, important challenge and the challenge is uh, that we have to um, uh, reconsider tourism uh, in, in, from the point of view of the sustainable world tourism, but not just as a way of discussing things but as a very, very important tool of action. And this is what uh, Italian uh, firms are doing right now. They are trying to develop plans of development uh, from a sustainable point of view, uh, with a lot of action that can really uh, be a guarantee for the, for the tourist. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, Hanchin and Valentina, both of you, I'm gonna go into the questions now. Since you mentioned the sustainability, Valentina, I would like to ask both of you. Emel Adamush uh, asked this question. I don't know if you see it on your screen or not, but uh, she says that, hello, will there be any initiatives for sustainability after such an amazing recovery, nature and destinations of areas, and how do you think? Valentina, since you mentioned sustainability, please, answer this question quickly, then I will go to Hunter. Yeah. One thing I would like to underline is that, especially in Southern Italy, which is really, uh, I think the uh, Southern Italy faced the problem in a very good way. And we were also lucky, maybe, I don't know, but there are there is a safer situation. There are uh, four destinations that are uh, very important in our Gulf, because there are the two islands, like uh, Capri Islands and Ischia Islands, and then Sorrento Peninsula and the Malfitan Coast, uh, where uh, the main firms in these areas uh, are elaborating a plan for the sustainability of the areas. So some interventions uh, in energy rather than uh, in uh, working to, to have a clean environment and also for the transports, uh, new ways of transport, green and blue for the sea, uh, they are also adding uh, a specific, um, uh, like a, a sort of label for each of these destinations where the firms that can get this label have some specific uh, um, uh, factors uh, in terms of safety, of security, apart from the instructions Wonderful. that are given by Thank the government. They are also adding some aspects uh, that uh, also characterize uh, the tourist offer in that specific area. Uh, so uh, each firm uh, is uh, proposing a very, very uh, charming and, you know, uh, very comfortable uh, service that is made of particular tools and uh, uh, hints for the client and the customer so that it can be more satisfied. Um, and one thing that I would like to underline is that some of the activities are shared by the destinations because they need, you know, like a, a, an inter-destination approach. Uh, others regard each of them in particular. And this is the way uh, we in Italy usually propose our services in Italy because they are made in Italy services. And this is the approach we are trying to keep in this process. Wonderful, thank you. How about you, Anjin? How is the sustainability, do you think, there will be a more emphasis on sorry i cannot hear you stop 
bu sustainable Okay, can you hear me, Hanjin? Did you hear me? No, no, it's better. Yeah, no, you're back. I lost okay. you for a while. I don't know what's going on, but the internet connection sometimes may be a little bit tricky. Yeah. So back to you, Hanjin. What about the sustainability emphasis after Corona uh, pandemic in China? Well, I think it's going to be very difficult now. The companies are thinking about uh, how to survive. And uh, uh, first of all, I guess we're talking about the, the survival first. Some, I heard some companies start laying off already. And then in order to be a sustainable, probably they need to think more creatively and then looking for uh, probably lower the price and uh, uh, picking up the basic cash flow first. And I guess uh, I think they have to think about the business survival first before uh, talking about anything else at this stage. But I assume that sustainability is going to happen anyway because the numbers are down, right? Yeah. You were talking about 50% occupancy, 25% of the buses, all that stuff. So I'm going to move on to the uh, many, many questions are coming. So quickly, uh, I would like to bring the question from Sedan Doan. Thanks to her for asking this question. What kind of precautions and or virus related behaviors must remain when the virus situation goes away. I assume that she's asking within the context of tourism and hospitality. So I, Hanjin, you told us that there is now temperature checks, right? Yes. Which is kind of like normal. And people have to get a certificate that they are free of right. corona. Then yes. they are allowed to board the trains. Do you think that at least in China and, and, and uh, Valentina, we're gonna ask you for Italy. Is this gonna um, continue? even after the pandemic is over, hopefully that there is no more danger anymore. Um, uh, Hanjin, no I asked you about China. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, are you asking me? Yes, yes. Uh, I guess uh, from what I have seen in China, particularly in the city I'm based in, this will continue for quite a while because uh, there's a speculation that uh, the virus may come back again. So I don't see any sign of taking less measures unless uh, we are absolutely sure. And uh, even our students coming back on campus, the university has arranged the buses and to pick them up from all different, three different train stations, airport, and then they will be brought back to the campus and still uh, absolutely quarantined. I think they're still no, very strict measures from every stop. The university, we just had a meeting this morning and it goes through 10 different measures to make sure that uh, there's no risk. I, I don't see this is going to, uh, to disappear in, in the next few months or maybe even later the year. It is good that we, we like it, is to keep it very safe, especially the students coming from all different cities. So they are very, very, uh, you know, cautious on this. Right, we're going to talk about education in a second, but Valentina, let's hear from you about this particular question in terms yeah. of life after corona. Will, will there be changes well, forever? My idea is that unless a clear remedy is found out, uh, there will be um, there will be strict rules anyway to follow, especially uh, the social distance and the use of masks and you know this kind of stuff. Uh, so uh, this, uh, I think, will will uh, will will accompany or will come with the firms and the the day in their activity, their daily activity, uh, for a few months at least, and then we will see what's happening. Uh, but um, uh, we have to be very, caution is required right now. For example, even restaurants in Italy, we have uh, a great problem because uh, uh, the, um, the the restaurants have very very uh, small uh, areas. Okay, because the streets are narrow in Italy, everything is small. So there is a huge problem about the social distance. How can they manage this and how can they be profitable from this point of view? Because there is also uh, this problem that is connecting. So now everything uh, is at the study and they are trying to see if there are some open spaces that can be used for this kind of activities in order to help them keep the social distance. Of course, firms have to be creative because if we think about social distance, 
in a sector like ours where you know the emotion is the thing that really uh, uh, strikes you when you when you leave the experience of tourism uh, you, we have to find we have to find find a way uh, you know to to give a safe message but at the same time uh, to feel uh, to give also an impression of something that is very comfortable warming and uh, uh, close to the uh, the customers needs right and we have one follow-up question from alessia puglia how do you think the tourism industries could handle carry out all of the safety measures that will be required in order to ensure safety for all the tourists so in my opinion for this question just like you said right now the the, the issue is to come back right survival because in America also too, there is a lot of tension. Maybe some of you watch from the media, but there is even protest, protests that really say that we don't want to quarantine. You know, we don't want to stay at home, so give us our rights. Like they are talking about human rights. So currently the hospitality tourism industry, they just would like to get it back, whatever, in whatever capacity it might be. So um, I think in China, in Italy, hotels, restaurants, tourism organizations welcome all the precautions like temperature checks. Emirates Airlines, you probably heard that they give even people corona tests, rapid tests before they board the planes. And I hear that more and more uh, companies are gonna do similar things to clear people, their mind that people are not sick. That's how the consumer confidence is gonna come from. You know, Georgia, uh, the state of Georgia opened up. It's the first state that opened up after all the restrictions. Not all the restrictions, but at least some of the restrictions. And tourists are still scared to go there. People are not ready yet because they need to have that confidence uh, for this to happen. And like I said, we're going to go into the uh, education in a second. But here's one question from Jack uh, She. I would like to ask professors, how do you feel like the outbound, outbound tourism of your own location in the next few months? In other words, will Italians travel outside of Italy? Will Chinese? You know, China lost the new year, right? The new year was in that time. I don't know the statistics, but millions of Chinese tourists usually go abroad uh, during, the, um, during the new year, Chinese new year. That was impacted severely. And do you think that people are going to start going to outside of locations soon from Italy and China? Uh, Han Chin, let's start with you, please. Uh, well, I think in either inbound or outbound, that will still consider international traveling. And uh, at the moment, I think we are only, particularly for the city I'm in, we are only allowed to travel within the city. It's now even outside the city. If you go outside the city, you have to apply for all kind of permit to make sure that uh, you know you are safe and then you have this green code. And then uh, I think it's still under a lot of uh, uh, cautious measures for even travel within China, even though you are allowed, but uh, there are certain measures taken. I do not see in the near future that people can go outside China as we used to. Right. And also, Hanshin, you just answered Peter Varga's question. Chinese tourist foreign travel intention is up to 50% more than before COVID-19. Will China control of outbound tourist numbers? You just answered that one. So I just want to yeah, yeah. point it out that, that it is not easy yet. It, it will come. It will probably take a year for it to come back to normal, provided that there is no second Outbreak. Mm. How about Italy, Valentina, about that one for the outbound? Um, I think uh, Italians love to travel and they are waiting for the time to start traveling. Uh, but of course, there is a change in the between, I think, uh, inbound and outbound tourism right now uh, because uh, it's considered to be safer to stay uh, in uh, one's region, in one's country. And from this point of view, I think, uh, uh, you know, in the first phase, uh, maybe there will be a more um, an increase in domestic tourism right. but i think that uh, italians since they love to go abroad they love to travel once they uh, have a clear idea that uh, a country or a destination is safe i think they're going yeah i am the first one 
<laughs> Wonderful. Me too. You know, I have the pleasure of serving in both of your universities as a visiting professor at Nankai University and also University of Naples Federico II. If the corona did not happen, I was supposed to come to Nankai University in the beginning of March to record a lecture yeah. for Professor Hanchin. And Valentino, I would be now, right? I would be in yeah. Italy as we speak. And two weeks ago, we had a conference. Yeah. We were going to have a conference, but we had to cancel it, unfortunately. So we'll come back. Let's switch to education. But let me just ask you one more question from one of our uh, audience member. By the way, our numbers increase now. We have more than 80 people joining. For those of you who just joined us new, if you have any questions for, for Pro Professor Hanchin and Valentina, please let us know. Simone uh, L said that I would like to know how, in your opinion, tourism companies can face this crisis and what strategies can be used. Uh, who would like to go first? Uh, Valentina Hanchin uh, about the tourism crisis strategies in China or in Italy? China before, let's keep the same order. <laughs> okay. 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 Uh, well, I, I guess it's going to be very difficult for the companies and also for the hotels and for the airlines. It's, uh, uh, it's not something is up to the individual company or the, the CEOs. It is there are a lot of government measures you need to follow. So I, I think when I was looking at the sea trip, uh, when uh, in early February or late January was trying to catch a flight back to uh, China from Hong Kong. And uh, basically uh, you are allowed to change at any time. Like sea trip has a very clear refund policy. Basically any request of changes will be entertained and no administrative charges at all. So I guess uh, uh, according to the government instructions they have to follow. So it's going to be very difficult for the company. Now it's more than the normal business crisis management. It's so much beyond than that, I think. It really depends on the all overall situation. I guess whatever comes first is the safety for everyone involved. Uh, I, I really cannot predict. I guess it has to be very much depend on how the situation is going to be stabilized. And also uh, it's not just within one country it's going to be involved. Uh, in, in many, many other aspects, it's very difficult to predict at this moment. Uh, I think the companies need to be prepared uh, for, uh, it's going to be a very difficult time. Right. How about uh, Italy, Valentina? Uh, well, um, I think that, uh, and I would like also to give a positive message also to the students in hospitality field that are listening to us, because uh, one thing I can tell is that uh, firms are very willing to also apply, you know, new tools and new approaches that are necessary in this process. Uh, putting safety uh, in the first place, safety for the customers and safety also for the employees, people that work in the firm. So this is a, the first challenge of responsibility they are called to, uh, to answer. And they are really uh, organizing themselves to ensure the safety of the customer. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, they are also trying to develop strategies that can, uh, you know, uh, favor a more genuine offer, uh, the connection with nature, uh, trying also new ways of proposing experiences uh, that are perceived as uh, safer also by the customer. Of course, we also have to distinguish between leisure tourism and mice industry, because I think that mice industry is at a, in a very difficult situation right now. And so uh, all those hospitality, uh, you know, uh, firms that are working a lot with uh, conferences and congresses, uh, they have to, to, to find new strategies. And this is not easy because I, I don't think this business in particular, we start to gain uh, uh, in the short way. Uh, at the same time, however, uh, if we think about also art cities in Italy, uh, where there is a high percentage of foreign tourism, also art cities have to uh, reinvent their offer to propose something that is different, that ensures safety and also uh, a lot of activities in the open air. And so we have uh, theaters and parks the, and museums that are starting collaborating for initiatives in the open air. 
So you will be able to, for example, uh, in Naples, you can uh, also listen to a concert of classical music in the wonderful uh, park of one of our museums in uh, Capodimonte, for example. So these are the initiatives that they are trying to, to put in place. Right, perfect, thank you. And I would like to just bring this question quickly. Uh, Angelica Doluca, uh, Lo Duca, for all, does it exist a real-time observatory of tourism, tourist arrivals, number of pre presences, where to monitor the real-time situation? For this question, um, at least in the United States, there is one company which I had uh, worked with them earlier. Let me see if I can show uh, my screen very quickly. This is a company called Hotel Runner. Hotel Runner is a distribution company. They have 38,000 hotels from 110 plus countries and they share their booking numbers. So this is the actual booking numbers per week that you see that for uh, from April and it's compared last year to this year. So hotelrunner.com is one that I know and I know that Smith Travel Research also uh, uh, shares the um, the data from the global world. I don't know if there is any uh, additional uh, agencies or statistics agencies or firms or companies that share this information. Real tourism numbers. Uh, Hanchin, is there anything in China? Mm, not that I am aware of, yeah. Right. Maybe CTRIP may have some data, but I don't know if they share or not. Maybe we'll see more later. How about you, Valentina? How about in Italy? I think this person uh, pointed out one of the main weaknesses in the Italian system because we do not have actually a real observatory in Italy. And this right. is uh, one of the reasons why I recently uh, wrote also the government about this because uh, uh, it's very important to have an, uh, you know, uh, uh, an update, a continuous update, uh, and for, to monitor the situations and see what's really happening. Uh, so there are some activities that are made by the um, the national organization for the promotion of Italy uh, in tourism, and some activities by the regions, but there is a lot of confusion about that. And I think this is one of the items uh, uh, where we, we should work quickly on. Okay, wonderful. Uh, one last question before we go into education. Uh, uh, Andres is joining us from Costa Rica. Welcome to him and the, the rest of the world. I see that we have many, many people from different parts of the world, which is amazing. That's the power of technology here. Do you think that countries will have to implement some sort of requirement to start receiving foreigners, such as asking for a free of corona certificate? I think that in, a, in America, there is not, to, I don't think that they require this. How about in China? I know that China, you have to have for domestic tourists to go from one location to another, but is there such a thing or will there be, do you know any plans? If I wanna come to China, for example, or Italy, do I have to get a free of corona certificate to come? Uh, well, I guess it's highly likely domestically, we are all required to register online through WeChat and uh, uh, the barcode everywhere you go. You need to screen, you need to show your green health code. So that's a must for everyone. On top of that, I guess my understanding is that they want to trace down how many people come into any restaurant, any shops, even the community shop in front of my building, they would ask you to scan the, the, the code provided by the shop. That makes that they documenting who comes in, who uh, came at what time, if anything detected, and they can trace you down. So there are two different measures already in place. Everywhere you go, you are required to do this. So I guess it is likely, probably, you know, for international, I, I would imagine, but I don't know. Uh, I think it's a safe, it's a, it's a good way to make sure that, uh, uh, first of all, you are healthy, and secondly, when you come to a place uh, you are not normally to be and to show people that uh, you are virus free. And also if there's something happen for the people near you, then they can trace down easily. I, I think it's going to become very transparent. Wonderful. 
Valentina, how about in Italy? Are there any talks about requiring uh, people to have a certificate? Yes, uh, we can say that there are, first of all, uh, some specific requests by the international uh, or tour operators. So the firms uh, need to have some specific, uh, you know, um, rules to follow and they also have to show some certificates. So it's a quite complex uh, uh, evaluation that, that is made by the, the tour operators, internationally speaking. Uh, but at the same time, uh, in, in this case, I think uh, uh, we have to be very careful uh, about the idea of a free of corona uh, certificate because first of all it does not depend on the firm itself but also on the destination so uh, there is a, a great influence between uh, the, the situation in the destination and the perception you know of the safety in the firm so this is the first problem that firms have to to manage uh, secondly uh, I don't think it's uh, uh, the message of free of corona because if anything happens it's it's terrible then i mean you have to uh, uh, transmit the idea of a very safe place uh, and but i think that we also have to uh, develop uh, this idea in the long run this can be a challenge because uh, uh, if we think about the word in chinese okay of crisis uh, there are two ideograms uh, one is a, a threat and one is an opportunity. So we have to use this as an opportunity because if we adopt a sustainable and safe approach, this has to continue in a different way maybe, but this is the, uh, the real storytelling we can do. Right. So there is a big change on the plate. Okay, let's switch to education. So we are all educators. I work at University of South Florida. Professor Hanchin from Nankai University. Uh, Professor Valentina is from University of Naples, Federico II in Italy. So in America, at least as far as I'm concerned, I'm teaching online education for the last 20 years. This is not new for me. And believe me that 20 years ago, I was uh, recording my lectures. Amateur, of course, not very easy. Now it's much easier, just like we are doing right now we are using a website, we are recording this and live streaming at the same time. We have Zoom now. So at least I was not shocked when we were getting the order from our university, no more face-to-face -face education. Now everything is going to what they call remote education, synchronous or asynchronous. But I know in China and maybe in Italy, I don't want to assume, but at least uh, that was my perception that online education was perceived a little bit lower than the face-to-face -face, uh, education. But this pandemic required all of us that are in China, Italy, and Turkey, or, or for the rest of the world, immediately switch from face-to-face -to, -face to online education. What did this mean for your countries? Hanchin, let's start with you. What challenges or opportunities did this bring to Chinese education? Thank you very much. Uh, well, it's a, it, it is a big challenge for everyone, I'm sure. And then, but I think uh, because the, the situation in China happened earlier, so we have have had some experience of dealing with this. Starting from the Ministry of Education in China, they have uh, said it clearly to all, send a clear message to all the university schools at all different levels, kindergarten and the primary. Uh, all the way to university, that uh, the schools are shut down and then the classes are stopped offline, but the learning and teaching will continue. So that 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 is the clearest uh, message, and also uh, sent by the uh, Ministry of Education in China. So ever since the end of January, uh, all university senior management start preparing for this, and uh, particularly in Nankai, I I came back on. We were in uh, winter break, starting from uh, January uh, 16 to uh, February 16. I think it's about four, four weeks to five weeks holiday. Normally, we didn't have to come back until mid-February to prepare for the starting of the new semester on um, February 17 this year. So then I was uh, called back earlier. Okay. And then of course, as a senior administrator, I need to be uh, there. I came back and then we attended all kind of meetings and be prepared for this. And the university-wide immediately organized online teachers training. 
And uh, so I was heavily involved and then uh, uh, helping out, coming up with strategies. I think it was very helpful meetings and discussions among the senior um, uh, administrators and uh, uh, management team. And then uh, what we did is to uh, allow three different ways of, of course, uh, the classes, uh, uh, the, the schools are shut down. Uh, the students, we know they are not coming back. And then uh, uh, we, we were able to start the classes and the teaching online right on time, meaning that uh, our semester started on February 17 online with a lot of preparation and the training. And then we allow three different ways of online teaching. And for those colleagues who are not exposed to any online teaching before, we ask them to do the minimum. Uh, basically, you can do a, a spark, we call it. You share your teaching materials, you give a lot of preparation for your students, you talk to them. So that is the minimum. And then you will be doing uh, live broadcasting for sure. For example, if your class is on Monday at nine o'clock, you will be there. So we, we ask that's the minimum you should do. And then the, the second way is that you are adopting others' material, the online material, MOOCs, and whatever you can do. And then plus the, the live broadcasting uh, plus the WeChat. And then thirdly, which is the highest level uh, you can achieve, is that you have your own MOOCs. Like for myself, I, I recorded my lecture, I shared my, my courses around the world. So therefore, my life was a bit of easier. And then uh, what I did is that I asked all my students and take my MOOCs online, and then we will just do online discussion. Then every other week, we do live broadcasting, then we add some new content. That was my original idea anyway, 50% online and 50% uh, interaction. So basically we allow three different ways, and but everyone has to teach online, that's a clear message. We had some resistance from a few professors and later on, but we sort of uh, compromised a little bit, you can delay your class. But then later on, we realized that's going to be difficult because some students have to graduate. So eventually, because we have two short semesters, some was hesitating, we allowed them to think about it. And then they didn't offer the class on the first eight weeks. So they double up on the remaining eight weeks. They still managed to finish everything within this semester. And then uh, so far so good, we managed to, uh, to, to get our class going on time. And then also we allow uh, online uh, sort of uh, um, continuous assessment and then exam, still some exams, particularly the lab driven exams, probably we have to do some special measures, delay that. But for majority of the exams which can be taken online, we even can see the proctor exam. So it seems so far so good, we managed to get all the classes uh, going on, on, on time and the students will be able to finish what they need to finish. Wonderful, thank you, yeah. Yes, I will ask you about the future in a second, but let's hear from Valentina. How did Italy face this online or remote education challenge? What happened? Mm -hmm. in I sharing a few slides or? Yeah, okay? feel free, absolutely. Okay. Here we go. Yep. Just a minute. We see. Okay. Just a minute, Georgia. I don't know. Good, what... that, good that you have your son there with you. Uh, <laughs> He's texting. No, I don't know what happened here, but it's not the. We see. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I go on this one. Can you see this one? Uh, no, you need to stop and share again. You need to choose which screen you need to share. Then it will Sorry come. About that, but no, no, that's okay. This is live stream, so it can happen. And yeah. um, okay, uh, well, as regards, um, just pick the screen you like, Valentina. Okay, George.
Okay. Uh, well, uh, as regards uh, the situation in Italy, uh, there were prompt interventions from the minister uh, that allowed uh, universities to uh, set a lot of uh, important uh, tools for uh, digital uh, teaching. Of course, there were different situations between universities. For example, uh, to be frank, I was very, very lucky to be in Federico II because we have an online platform. So we have had it since a lot of years. And so we have some experience with uh, with digital teaching. And uh, uh, But there, there were a lot of incentives, very important incentives, uh, both for students and for uh, universities to, you know, to uh, use in the best way uh, this kind of tools. And in fact, for example, the University uh, uh, of Federico II got very important results in terms of exams that were uh, uh, taken between uh, the 9th of March and the 9th of April, and uh, also a lot of graduations. So uh, things are going on. Even in my courses, uh, not, we, we didn't lose one lesson because we are continuing to uh, to make all the activities. And what is interesting, I think, in Italy is the perception of people regarding this kind of teaching. Uh, because uh, Italians are expecting uh, to use digital tools more also in the future in this sector. And also the uh, digital devices that uh, that are proposed are, uh, have been used with a, with a huge increase. And even from the population that usually uh, never use such tools. Uh, for 46 of the people are willing to use also this kind of systems of smart working, even when they go back to work. And so this is very important. Uh, if we consider the, you know, the different um, generations, we are making a study on higher education to see uh, what is the propensity towards the digital uh, tools in education in different uh, uh, fields, or not only in uh, young people, but also considering you know, um, uh, possible uh, courses and uh, uh, specialization activities for for uh, for older people uh, and uh, uh, it's interesting to see that the millennials really uh, or now use uh, digital tools for any kind of things that they do and so uh, from this point of view uh, in terms of uh, education uh, we are really enlarging uh, the the range of tools we are using for teaching so this was a great experience for all of us uh, the Z, the Z, the Z generation uh, that is approaching of, to, to, to digital stuff is, uh, uh, shows also this propensity for different activities, uh, and it's uh, when they this this generation will be millennial. This 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 red area will be even even larger. So we have to think about this because ninety four percent of students will benefit from e learning and thinks they will benefit. They are appreciating a lot of things from uh, from e learning. Of course, one thing that our students really miss is the social side. Is the aspect of meeting each other. Uh, the same is for uh, smart working because the percentage in smart working uh, are of course different from the uh, education stuff, but uh, people um, think uh, are appreciating some of the aspects of the digital activities. And this uh, I think is a, is a very important lesson for us because uh, my guess is that in the future, soon after the pandemic, uh, we as teachers will have a wider set of tools that we can use. And our students have a lot of more tools that can really stimulate their interacting. For example, my my the students in my course they, that were accustomed to uh, to uh, have you know like uh, um, uh, lessons where they had to work together in teams and develop projects together, uh, they are still doing this uh, through the online system that we we adopt. Uh, they are starting now a very important lab uh, that is conceived to, for for the firms and the uh, and at the same time the uh, and the students in order to uh, to to build to 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 work on projects that are useful for the firms that are involved because they are partners of our course and this is very important before the stage period. Uh, I think we are uh, really enriching uh, our you know um, uh, background of everything. And at the same time, we can use uh, the digital tools 
to better uh, develop a sustainable approach even in, in, in our uh, learning activities. And I think this is the challenge for, for our future. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, Valentina, you also answered the question about the future as well, too. Yeah. Uh, what is that going to do for... So, Hanjin, I know that you are a leader in uh, online education. You developed MOOCs uh, even uh, right now in Nankai University in your previous institutions. What do you think about the future of education in China? You mentioned that in May 8, the students are coming back to campus. If... Let's say that six months later, nobody remembers Corona. Corona is finished. Everybody is healthy. Do you think that Chinese education system will go back to 90% face-to-face education? Or do you think that this impact is going to continue and educators are going to use a hybrid system? Just like Valentina was telling earlier, like many people are going to use this again. What is your idea about that in China? future of education? Uh, well, I, I, I'm a future believer. I believe that one way or the other, even before the coronavirus, I was thinking that the future of university will be one way or the other affected by technology. And uh, uh, with the coronavirus, unfortunately, so people uh, do suffer a lot and then uh, it certainly speed up and the process of advancing uh, the education through technology enhanced. And immediately I think uh, uh, we have, now the Ministry of Education has already made it very clear that uh, uh, they support this uh, online, offline blended learning. All the classes, uh, particularly those big classes, over 100 people, most of the concept, the uh, very basic knowledge can be delivered online. Actually, before this uh, uh, coronavirus, I was in Australia, I was in UK, particularly in Monash. The whole teaching block, uh, teaching learning building was converted into all sort of interactive technology enhanced, digitalized learning environment. Nobody goes to the large classroom anymore. So that was before the coronavirus. So I, I particularly believe that uh, it is going to happen to be that way. And we are prepared to, to, to take a lead on that. I have already uh, worked with my management team and uh, my associate dean in uh, learning and teaching and looking after the uh, teaching side of the college. We will convert most of the, almost all the uh, core courses and and 50%, only 50% of the essential concepts and series. For example, the research method. You don't have to teach research method repeating to all different classes on uh, what is a literature review, what is a qualitative research, and what is quantitative research. So mm -hmm. we have already uh, made this uh, research method online. And then everyone is asking for our class, for our MOOCs. So one of the very junior faculty and a very active researcher uh, is leading that course. She just joined us from a Poly U. And a few others, uh, we developed tourism planning and the policy. We developed China's role in the global tourism industry. And uh, this course, all the concept, what is international tourism, what is domestic tourism, we have all made it online and then shared globally. And then the, this is the only the first batch of the courses. We already got the funding to convert the remaining probably 10 more courses and uh, uh, this year we'll finish that and eventually we want all our core curriculum to be online for the essential part then we will save the space and the time in the curriculum to uh, do the uh, small class discussion experiential learning and then i am bringing a major company to our campus uh, to show us how smart tourism actually works for the theme parks for the hotels and all these smart services, just bring them to the classroom because they don't have to learn. We save the classroom time for uh, discussion by working with the industry. But they actually come to our online class. So, and then I'm building a TED Talk uh, uh, studio type of classroom. So all the global leaders were invited 
and professors like yourself and uh, Professor Valentina, if you come to Nankai with your permission, we will record your lectures with a TED Talk style and then uh, make it available to all the schools in, in, in China because uh, the education resources in China are not very evenly distributed. We are in a very fortunate position as a major comprehensive university with a healthy funding, but a lot of small colleges in the remote areas, we plan to share our courses for free. And also okay. we will Skype them into our classroom, just like this, what we're teaching. Everyone in the small village can listen to the leading professors and the scholars to share with them the most updated knowledge. So that's my big plan in the next two years. To, to, to make it a three stage. First stage, we build a core concept online and series, and then we save the classroom time and then to work with industry leaders and uh, bring our students and industry leaders together. And thirdly, we build the experiential center with a smart technology on campus. So I hope I can show everyone this facility. Uh, if enter, it can be uh, an, held on time, not okay. postponed in January 2021, which will be hosted by Nankai. Thank you. Yes, thank you. You know, uh, Hanshin, absolutely enter uh, uh, is going to take place in, in Nankai University in Tianjin in January next year. And Hanshin and I are the co-chairs of this conference, but uh, we hope that by January next year, things are gonna go back to normal and we'll see it. Hanshin, you, uh, we're gonna close soon because we are over one hour limit, but very quickly, you mentioned something very interesting. You said you, we have got the funding to convert these classes into MOOC format, right, online? Yes. That funding yes. Is, is critical because it's not easy. We are doing, mm -hmm. I am doing currently, along with Sedan Doan, Gerzde Tuktahan, and Muitin Chavusholu, a global study on students who are who switch to this remote education. What we have found in there that some professors were not ready or universities were not ready because it requires infrastructure to be able to do that. Some professors just like put the PowerPoint slides into a website and, and call that remote instruction. So clearly that's not what it is. It takes time. It takes a lot of effort to, to do that. Online education is not easy. It, it, it is really probably even more laborious, at least in the first run. But the effective part is that you can reach to many more people once you do the, that first initial work. For this reason, uh, we also converted our own uh, master's program for hospitality management at the University of South Florida from face-to-face to 100% -face to, uh, online. Corona was not the reason why we have done it. We were discussing this for a long time, but it did come uh, happen like this. So um, the they're asking if you can share your presentations with the audience. Uh, yeah. Let me know, and we can put it on m3center.org website. Yeah. Uh, uh, can I just tell two things? Because yeah, uh, uh, in education, I think also it depends on the sector, of course, because there are some uh, activities like lab activities uh, in uh, medicine rather than biology or this kind of stuff. They need to work uh, on the side. I mean, uh, for us, uh, we can really uh, think about mixing the tools. And this is what we are doing also in my course. Uh, and I would like, uh, can I can I just share a, a slide with the information? Sure. Because now the uh, people can can uh, um, can apply for the uh, for the application. You can send the applications because we have applications for our foreign students till the fifteenth of May. As uh, one one p.m. and for the Italian students, uh, there will be the call uh, on this website, and uh, uh, it's not really ready, but it will be ready in a in a short time. So stay tuned because we will give all the information. We also have a PhD call uh, with one scholarship in tourism. So for those who are interested, it can be a good opportunity if they want to come to uh, study for a while in Italy. And uh, I think it's very important for all of us to exchange our experiences and views. Wonderful. Thank you. Valentina, we will also post that information on m3center.org as well for those of them, along with your uh, slides, if you share. Uh, Jinfa Zhang, hello, everyone. I would like to know about preventive measures 
regarding international students preparing to study in your countries, especially in China. Uh, Han Chin, let's start with you quickly, very quickly. Okay. Is there anything uh, going on right now in China? Well, so actually, uh, well, of course, at the moment, our international student cannot come back. But I'm sure, you know, when things are clear, we will still welcome all the international students. In fact, actually, just a couple of weeks ago, we just interviewed uh, a batch of uh, international students applying for Nankai PhDs. I took one girl uh, from uh, uh, Middle East. So uh, I'm sure the international students will continue to welcome you. And I think as soon as this uh, uh, travel ban is cleared, I'm sure things will go back to normal. Yeah. Right. How about you, Valentina, in Italy? Yeah, uh, I think uh, students in Italy will have a lot of opportunities because we will have uh, uh, the two channels working together. I mean, both online and uh, uh, on-site. So, uh, for example, even the master degrees, and uh, as you were telling before, there are a lot of online uh, modules that can be taken. Uh, so there is the possibility for those that are abroad and cannot really uh, attend the uh, the university, they can apply for the, the online activity. Activities. And we also have a lot of MOOCs on our website that is open and free as uh, in China. So I'm glad that we are sharing this approach of, you know, uh, for a free culture. And I think it's very important because being free uh, doesn't mean that it's not uh, something uh, valuable and uh, rich and intense, but maybe it's the opposite. <laughs> Absolutely. I agree with you. We also, M3 Center at University of South Florida, is yeah. putting together a book and we will open it up to everybody. Thank you so much. In closing, I just want to uh, show you Mr. Özge Ersu. Valentina, you met him in Istanbul in Globe Conference. Oh, okay. He's a professional yeah. travel guide. Very, yeah. very special man. He's saying great discussion, so much to be noted. And he thanks us in three different languages. Teşekkürler in Turkish. Şiye şiye Prof. Hançin. E grazie molto. Sigra corte. I guess that I don't speak Italian, but optimistic and pessimistic aspects, hopes and recovery. Yeah. We also thank him. And all of the viewers, we still have a lot of live audience, even though we passed the one hour mark that we have set for ourselves. Uh, Professor Han Chin, Professor Valentina, thank you so much. Let's take your closing remarks in one minute or less. Dr. Han Chin. Thank you very much for Chihan organizing this a very uh, informative and session, which I really appreciate. I'm glad that we were able to uh, talk. And thanks to the technology, we continue to what we're doing. I'm sure we have all kind of opportunities to work together with all two of you and with the rest of the world. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Professor Valentina. Yeah, uh, I think we can manage the situation. Uh, and uh, I also think that all of us uh, can work together uh, to really live in a better world. And this is a, a very important responsibility that we all have. I, I, I appreciate it. Thank you again. I agree with you. The hope is here. We are going to overcome this. Tourism industry is resilient. Education, educators are resilient. Look how much we quickly we can adapt. And the students also are amazing as well, too. So they are adapting themselves. Hopefully they are learning lifelong lessons from this crisis that they can apply in their lives uh, later. Uh, we were live from China. Uh, Professor Han Chin, it's 9.13 p.m. there. So thank you for staying up for us. And Professor Valentina, it's 3.13 p.m. in Italy, Naples right now. And yeah. we are at 9.13 uh, in, in Sarasota, Florida. And thank you again. Hopefully we'll see you in person in Italy yeah. and China. Okay. And we can post you in Florida as well. Yeah. Wish okay. everyone uh, very safe and healthy. Thank yeah. you. You too as well. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks for Bye. listening to us. Bye. Bye.